In land ownership rights news, we come to the case of Sackett versus EPA. The Sacketts own a piece of land. This piece of land does not have water on it, but it is across the street from some water. So the EPA says that your land is part of the waters of the United States. Despite it not having water on it, despite it being across the road from some water, it is water enough. So you're not allowed to do what you want to on your land because it's part of the waters of the United States, and this would pollute the waters of the United States, so you're not allowed to do this. So the Sackets over here are like, but we don't have water on our land, though. And the EPA is like, we don't care. So in today's case, we're going to decide how far the EPA has when it comes to regulating water on property, which incidentally, by the way, is somewhat of a major issue, perhaps more major than you might think. The EPA gets involved in waters of the United States on lands quite frequently, including by preventing development. So this EPA power is fairly significant and manages to worm its way into quite a few people's lives. So let's figure out what the rule is as it relates to this. Let's get started with this. The petitioners, the Sackets over here, purchased property that was near Priest Lake, Idaho, and began to, you know, improve their lot in order to build a home on it. So they, the EPA over here said that their property contained wetlands, and doing the improvements that they were doing to their property in order to build on it would violate the Clean Water Act which prohibits discharging pollutants into the waters of the United States. So we bought a piece of land. It is not quite ready to build a property on. We need to do some things to the property to make it suitable to build a house on. We are starting to do the, the things to improve the property, to build the house on. The EPA over here is like, you're, you are polluting the waters of the United States, even though there's no water to be found. The EPA ordered the Sackets to restore the site to its original condition and threatened penalties of $40,000 every day. The EPA over here is definitely doing some mafiosa thing over here. Sorry you bought your land, everything. Uh, please remove it. Please restore it. And if you don't, we're going to charge you $40,000 each and every day because you don't bend to our will. So the EPA definitely playing some hardball over here. The EPA classified... There we go. The EPA classified the wetlands on the lot as waters of the United States because they were near a ditch that fed into a creek, which fed into a lake, which was across the street. So across the street was a ditch that went into a creek, that went into a lake, and the lake itself is navigatable. So therefore, the creek is navigatable. Therefore, the ditch is navigatable. Therefore, your land is navigatable waters. So I suppose get a boat and start cruising around the completely dry land that is navigatable water. All right. Do we need a boating license? Is that the problem? Unclear. The Sackets over here saying that this doesn't make any sense. Sued saying their properties are not waters of the United States because uh, there's no navigatable water to be found here. Uh, we don't see any. The district court and our summary judgment for the EPA looks fine to us, says district court. We see lots of water, water, water everywhere on your land. We don't know what you're talking about. We see water all over the place. The Ninth Circuit said, yeah, that sounds great to us, uh, that the Clean Water Act covers wetlands with an ecologically significant nexus that has traditional navigatable waters and to satisfy the standards. So basically close enough is the short. We have the right to protect the navigatable waters of the United States. And this is close enough because it has a nexus that's close and a ditch and a creek and blah, blah, blah. So can the EPA regulate this dry piece of land? Let's find out. The Supreme Court writes that the Clean Water Act's use of water in the United States refers only to geographical features that are described in ordinary parlance as streams, oceans, rivers, and lakes. So when we said water, what we meant was water. Water is what water means. Okay. And adjacent wetlands that are indistinguishable due to a continuous surface connection. So, you know, water and also waters that are near, that feed into the water. So water is water. Wow. Okay. To assist jurisdiction over adjacent wetland, 
under the Clean Water Act, a party must establish that first, the adjacent body of water constitutes water of the United States. Waters of the United States are a relatively permanent body of water connected to traditional interstate navigatable waters. So they have to be navigatable waters that, you know, you could like take a boat on. And if, you know, it's only sometimes water, because it's only sometimes a, a river, then, you know, okay. But it has to be relatively permanent. It can't just be, you know, completely intermediate. So it has to be a, you know, somewhat fixed body of water that is water that you could navigate on. Second, the wetland in question that is feeding into the water must have a continuous surface connection with the water that would make it difficult to determine where one water ends and another water begins. So if we get into this sort of line drawing problem of, hey, where exactly does the lake stop? Because there are some marshy areas around. Is that a lake? You know, that's a little bit marshy. And we can't quite decide where the lake ends and where it begins. So we'll include the marshy areas that feed into the lake. That sounds okay. We can cover that much. The uncertain meanings of waters of the United States has been a persistent problem, sparking decades of action and litigation. Yes, a, a lot of the time, a lot of people who own a lot of property and the EPA gets involved in their turf. And obviously this has been litigation a lot. Resolving the applicability to wetlands requires review of history surrounding the phrase. So we have to figure out what are wetlands now so that we can try to put this problem to bed. Let's see if we can do that. During the period relevant to the case, the two federal agencies charged with enforcement, the EPA and Army Corps of Engineers, who, by the way, are just complete badasses. So whatever they do in terms of their regulatory schemes and their regulatory overreach, we can certainly condemn. But I just want to say the Army Corps of Engineers are complete badasses. The stuff they do is truly amazing. In terms of water and water management, holy shit, the Army Corps of Engineers is cool. Just wanted to make that clear. Similarly, to find the waters of the United States to broadly encompass all waters that could affect interstate or foreign commerce. All waters that could affect interstate or foreign commerce, that just sounds like all water everywhere because water evaporates. And maybe the water will evaporate and go over to, I don't know, Europe and rain. And so it affects interstate commerce. It's an international relations problem when I'm doing on my land now. Uh-huh. The agencies in question gave expansive interpretation to wetlands adjacent to water, defining adjacent to mean bordering, contiguous, or neighboring. So as always, when we gave the agencies the power to interpret the law, as we do under Chevron, and we said, hey, agency, here's a law. Please interpret it. Uh, amazingly enough, they interpreted it in a way that gave them more power. What are the odds? Uh-huh. In a different case, the court confronted the Army Corps of Engineers' assertion of authority under the Clean Water Act over wetlands that actually abutted navigatable waters. Although concerned that wetlands fell outside the traditional notion of water, because it in and of itself is not navigatable, like a lake or river, the court deferred to the Corps, reasoning that the transition from water to solid ground is not necessarily, or even typically, an abrupt one. Sounds like Chevron to me, my friends. Sounds like Chevron to me. We are deferring to agency interpretation. So sure, it's, it's navigatable waters. So that sounds fine. My disdain for Chevron continues with every passing moment. Following a case, the agencies issued a migratory bird rule, extending the Clean Water Act jurisdiction to any water or wetland that are or would be used as a habitat by any migratory bird or endangered species. So if waterfowl use your water then, you know, that's those birds, those birds are traveling in interstate and in, even international commerce. So we have control not only over the birds, but the, but the water, because that's water enough, because the birds use it. Okay, unclear how this impacts my bird feeder. Uh-huh. The court did reject the rule after the court sought to apply it to several isolated ponds located wholly within the state of Illinois. Holding the Clean Water Act does not extend to ponds that are not adjacent to any open water. So, okay, fine. We, 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 we did find a limit somewhere. So we said, okay, the, the birds land in the ponds and the ponds are part of the waters. The Supreme Court finding a limit to Chevron somehow says, no, those are not part of the waters. 
They are isolated ponds. They are not part of the navigable waters. They're not part of the lakes and the rivers. They're just small ponds. And even though the waterfowl use them sometimes, no. They're not navigable waters. It's a pond. So we did find a limit somewhere. The agencies responded to this fairly clear-minded direction by instructing their field agents to determine the scope of clean water jurisdiction on a case-by-case -case basis, which, of course, wouldn't be abused in any way. So just figure it out case-by-case, -case, agents. I'm sure you won't abuse this power to give you power when you shouldn't have power. Okay. Within a few years of the uh, Army Corps of Engineers over here saying, you know, you figure it out, the agencies, including the, uh, including the EPA, had interpreted their jurisdiction over the water of the United States to cover somewhere between 270 and 300 million acres of wetland and virtually any parcel of land that contains a channel or conduit through which rainwater or drainage may occasionally or intermittently flow. Hey, does rain fall on your land? Does rain fall on your land? Does the rain that fall onto your land sometimes leave your land and go into water? Hey, now, the, now, your, now your land is part of the waters of the United States because it rains there sometimes. Because the rain moves and it goes into water. So the rain that falls onto your land, it, it's wetland now. It's raining. Can't you see how wet your land is? It's raining right now. Great. Against the backdrop, the court in a different case vacated a lower court decision that held the, cover, that held the Clean Water Act covered wetlands near ditches and drains that are emptied into navigable water several miles away. So again, somehow finding a limit to Chevron somehow, some way, we said, okay, we can't help noticing EPA that when we said wetlands that are continuous with the lakes and rivers so that it's unclear where the wetland begins and the lake starts because they're continuous and there's no interruption. We can't help noticing that when we said that. You said, how about wetlands near ditches that will somehow drain eventually into a navigable wa water that's several miles away? We can't help noticing that the area between the wetland and the lake is somewhat separated. So, uh, you know, no. Um, so we, we said we can't, we can't do that. But as the reason we can't do that, the court could not agree. So we're like, you can't do that, but we're not sure why. So that's really helpful to the, to the lower courts and the EPA. Yeah, you can't do that, but we're not sure why you can't do that. Four justices concluded that the Clean Water Act coverage was limited to certain relative permit bodies of water that would be connected to traditional interstate navigable waters and wetlands that, as a practical matter, are indistinguishable. In other words, continuous. Justice Kennedy, concurring only in the judgment, wrote, that the Clean Water Act jurisdiction over adjacent wetlands requires whatever a significant nexus is. What the hell is that? So maybe not continuous, maybe significant nexus. What does that mean? That's a good question. But it would require whatever the significant nexus is between the wetland and its adjacent navigable waters, which exists when the wetlands, either alone or in combination with other lands, significantly affects the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the water. What? What does that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> but if it significantly impacts the together or alone or in combination, similar lands and the region and integrity, how do I apply that? That's a really good question. I don't know. Following this confusing case law, the relative agencies brought nearly all water and wetland under the jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act by engaging in a fact-intensive significant nexus determination that turned on a lengthy list of hydrological and ecological factors. So the EPA over here, you know, is given a case that says, um, yeah, these wetlands are not wetlands enough, but we're not going to tell you why. And just figure out if it has a significant nexus, which to be fair to the EPA isn't particularly helpful. How's the EPA supposed to figure this out? I don't know. So I have a little bit of sympathy for the AB, EPA, just a little bit though because they're the ones abusing their power, but the instructions aren't particularly clear. So they do an open-ended inquiry that basically just sweeps in all water everywhere because, you know, they don't know what the rule is and they'd like more power. So between a combination of the Supreme Court, 
not telling them and their own greed of power, let's say that everything is a significant nexus because, you know, water evaporates and eventually will fall on the land and contaminate the water and blah, 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 blah. Landowners who even negligently discharge pollutants into navigatable waters without a permit face criminal charges. So fair enough, if you, you know, pour oil into the lake, you know, that's going to be a problem. Please don't do that. So yes, that makes sense. As things currently stand, the agencies that maintain the significant nexus test is sufficient to establish jurisdiction over whatever adjacent wetlands means. Because by adjacent, we mean somewhere vaguely near is apparently adjacent. By the EPA's own admission, nearly all waters and wetlands are susceptible to regulation under the test, putting a staggering array of landowners at risk of criminal prosecution for such mundane activities as moving dirt. Because the dirt might be contaminated and it goes into the water. So what adjacent means is anywhere vaguely nearby. Okay, fine. All right, so having specified that part of the EPA's standard, the court next turns its extent to the geographical reach. How much does this sweep in? Because the EPA has defined it to mean all water everywhere. How much is that? To make sense of Congress's choice to define navigatable water as being the waters of the United States, the court concludes the Clean Water Act's use of water encompasses only those that are relatively permanent, standing or continuously flowing bodies of water, forming geographic features that are described in the ordinary parlance as streams, oceans, rivers, and lakes. So waters of the United States means streams, ocean, rivers, and lakes that are navigatable so that you could put like a boat on it. So, okay. All right, fine. This reading follows from the Clean Water Act deliberate use of the polar waters, which refers to those body of water listed above, and also helps to align the meaning of waters of the United States with the term navigatable waters. So we are going to solve this problem, at least in part, by saying that waters of the United States means navigatable waters, means rivers and lakes and oceans and streams. Okay. More broadly, this reading accords with how Congress has used the term waters elsewhere in the Act and other law. The court has understood the Clean Water Act use of water in the same way. So we think waters of the United States are the navigatable waters of the United States. Okay, fine. The EPA's insistence that water is nationally read to encompass wetlands because the presence of water is universally regarded as the most basic feature of wetland proves too much. So, yeah, this is an argument that is sometimes what we call too clever by half, right? It proves too much, which is always a problem when you come to court, right? If your test proves too much, if it sweeps in too much, if it goes too far, right, that runs into a problem. So we appreciate your too clever by half argument that wetlands are water because it has the presence of water. But that argument, if we believe that, would sweep in all water, which is exactly what you've done, incidentally. So, yeah, wetlands include the water, but they are not waters of the United States because they're not navigatable waters for this purpose. You know, you can't put a boat on it and navigate them, right? That doesn't work. It's also tough to square the relevant exclusion of isolated ponds from the idea of what adjacent wetlands are to covered water. So we already said the isolated ponds are not waters. So it, that would also apply to wetlands for the same exact reason. Finally, it's difficult to see how the state's responsibilities and rights in regulating water would remain primary if the EPA is this far, which again, as it relates to this, right, the, the states may have their own regulations when it comes to the waters of their state, which of course, they are typically free to do. States can go further. The question is what does the Clean Water Act require, not what states can do. And states are supposed to be primary. So if we said EPA, you have control over all the water, what does that leave for the states? Not much. So we can't do that. Statutory context shows that some wetland does qualify as water. So yes, perhaps some wetland does qualify as water, but that doesn't mean all wetland qualifies as water. You can't, or that all water is wetland, or that a house that has some rain falling on it is a wetland. It doesn't mean those things. Specifically, the relevant law which authorizes states to conduct certain permitting programs 
specifies that discharges may be permitted into any water of the United States except those of traditional navigatable waters, which would include wetlands adjacent thereto, which would suggest at least some wetlands must qualify as water. So again, to the extent the wetlands are indistinguishable, then the federal law even says that's protected. So fine, the wetlands that are one of that where we can't draw a clean line between the wetland and the lake or the wetland and the river or the wetland and the ocean, as the case may be, fine, we can do that. But the relevant law cannot define what wetland means when the Queen Water Act regulates because it's not an operative perversion that defines the act's reach. So some special area of law says that states can permit dumping of stuff other than the navigatable waters, which in this particular instance includes wetlands. But that particular citation to wetland in that particular part of the statute does not read on the entire statute. So Congress, when it wrote a specific part of the statute, did use the term wetland, to be sure as it relates to what states can and cannot permit. So that's fine, but they used wetland in that specific instance. The specific overcomes the general, but you can't use the specific to define the general. So as far as the specific goes, of course it overrules the general, but it doesn't read on the entire general because then it would leave no general left. The reference in the statute to adjacent wastelands must be harmonized with the phrase waters of the United States, which is an operative term that defines the Clear Water Act's reach. Because adjacent wetlands are included within waters of the United States, these wetlands must qualify as waters of the United States in their own right. That is, be indistinguishable as part of the body of water that itself constitutes waters. So indistinguishable, right? It is part of a contemporaneous, continuous whole. To hold otherwise would require implausibly concluding that Congress talked an important expansion to the reach of the Clean Water Act into convoluted language in a relatively obscure provision that concerns a state permitting process. So again, it's just the specific is the specific and doesn't read on the general. That Congress in some specific part used the term wetlands, governs that part, but doesn't speak to the authority of the statute as a whole. Understanding the Clean Water Act to apply to wetlands that are distinguishable from otherwise covered waters of the United States would substantially broaden the statute to define navigatable waters as waters and adjacent wetlands. But the use of the term including makes it clear that it did not purport to do such a thing. It merely reflects Congress's assumption that certain wetlands are part of the U waters of the United States, at least for some limited purposes. To determine whether a wetland is part of the adjacent waters of the United States, the court agrees with the plurality of use of water. In sum, the relevant law extends only to wetlands that are, as a practical matter, indistinguishable from waters of the United States. This requires the party asserting jurisdiction to establish first, the adjacent body of water constitutes waters of the United States, which in and of itself is a relatively permanent body of water that's navigatable. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a river all the time, but you know, most of the time in a relatively permanent way. So that it's a river one day a year won't cut it, presumably. And second, the wetland has a continuous surface connection with that water, making it difficult to determine where the one water ends and where it begins. So continuous is necessary, so great. The EPA asked the court to defer to its most recent rule providing that adjacent wetlands are covered by the Clean Water Act if they possess a significant nexus, traditional navigatable waters. So we're back to the significant nexus test, but apparently what significant means is all the water everywhere. So yeah, the EPA's interpretation is inconsistent with the Clean Water Act's text and structure and clashes with background principles of construction of texts that apply to interpretation of the relevant provisions. So the EPA's idea goes too far. First, the exceedingly clear language that's required if Congress wishes to alter the federal state balance or the government's power over private property is not present. So yeah, Congress probably has the ability to do more in this domain if they want to, but they didn't, right? Congress does have authority when it comes to the waters of the United States. I mean, that much is clear. So they probably could pass more extensive statutes, but they didn't. The court has thus required a clear statement from Congress when determining the scope of waters of the United States. Secondly, the EPA's interpretation gives rise to serious vagueness concerns in light of the Clean Water Act's criminal penalties, thus implicating due process requirements with respect to penal statutes with sufficient definiteness that ordinary people can understand them. So if we interpreted it this far, we would have problems in the criminal context because we don't want statutes to be unduly vague. And this statute, if interpreted this way, would sweep in so much power 
that it is not really what is within the con. So the idea of the rule of lenity as an idea, reading a criminal statute more narrowly, also suggests this result. Where a penal statute could sweep in enough conduct to render a criminal a host of might what otherwise be ordinary activity, the court has been wary about going beyond what Congress clearly intended the statute to cover. Under these two principles, the judicial task of interpreting the waters of the United States is to ascertain the clear congressional authorization that exists to make sure that we're not sweeping in more conduct than Congress wrote about. The EPA claims that Congress ratified the regulatory definition of adjacent when it amended the Clean Water Act to include reference to adjacent wetlands in the relevant statute. So one of the things we're going to try is that this had been the policy of the EPA. And we think that Congress adopted our meaning when it amended the statute. So let's try that. This argument fails for at least three reasons. First, the text of the relevant law shows that adjacent cannot include wetlands that are merely nearby covered waters. Second, the EPA's argument cannot be reconciled with its court's repeated recognition. The relevant statute does not conclusively determine the construction to be placed on the relevant definition of navigable waters. The EPA claims that Congress ratified its interpretation of amended when it included the reference. The argument fails for at least three reasons. First, the relevant text shows that adjacent cannot include wetlands that are merely nearby covered waters. Second, the EPA's argument cannot be reconciled with this court's repeated recognition. The relevant statute does not conclusively determine the construction to be placed on a relevant definition of navigable waters. Third, the EPA falls short of establishing the sort of overwhelming evidence of the acquisitions necessary to support its argument in the face of Congress's failure to amend a different section of the statute, which is more relevant here. Finally, the EPA's various policy arguments about the ecological consequences of narrow definition are rejected because, well, maybe that's true, maybe not, but of course what we do is statutes, and that's not what Congress did. Alito delivers the opinion of the court in which Roberts, Thomas, Gorsuch, and Barrett join. Thomas files a concurring, Kagan files a concurring, in which Sotomayor and Jackson join, Kagan files an opinion concurring. So this is a unanimous Supreme Court, although they differ a little bit about the reasons. So they all agree, but for different reasons. So that's pretty cool. Thus, that brings us to the end of this case about the EPA, where their powers get a little bit lighter. So the EPA no longer has the ability to regulate all the water everywhere. They have the ability to regulate the navigable waters of the United States and the waters which are indistinguishable from the waters of the United States because they readily flow and are continuous with the flows of the United States. But not whatever this is. Because the guys are across from a ditch that flows into a stream that flows into a lake, not so much. That is not the waters of the United States. Nor, incidentally, does it seem like the ditch or the stream is, incidentally, by the way because they don't qualify as navigatable waters onto their own right. So the EPA power gets a little bit less. And the details, of course, will matter, as I'm sure the EPA will continue to try to expand its power to the limit. But those, you know, most outrageous excesses, at least for the moment, are barred. And that brings us to the end of discussion of this case.